first um, idea we had that there was something not quite right was we were sitting in the kitchen one night and we heard this kind of noise, you know, as if something was um, kind of a scratching noise. And I kind of looked around and I didn't take much notice, just carried on reading my paper. And then it got louder. It was coming from the loft above the kitchen. Crikey, I thought, you know, somebody's broken in. I know, somebody's taken the mickey. And it got louder and louder. And it was almost deafening. I know it sounds a bit odd, but it was really frightening, you know. And I says, right, I've had enough of this. I'm going to, going to take a look upstairs to see what's going on. So I grabbed myself a torch and an empty wine bottle. So all right then, so I walked up to the bottom of the stairs along the passage and I, I hesitated at the bottom of the stairs. And then I could hear the noise just as loud at the bottom of the stairs, which as I thought was weird, as it was in the kitchen. So I crept up the stairs with a torch in my hand and an empty wine bottle. And I, at the top of the stairs, I turned right, went through the door, and I could see the door of the passage, which is about, you know, 10, 15 foot away. And it was rattling. Like this. You know, as if somebody was inside trying to get out. So anyway, I completely approached the door now, and I burst into the door with a wine bottle, and I flashed the torch, and there's a kind of a wind. Wind in, in this room. As a kind of a, a murmuring, you know, not a not a voice actually, you know, um, as if somebody slowed the tape recorder down. <laughs> kind of a weird, strange noise, and then complete silence, almost an eerie silence. I just scratched my head and I thought, God, you know, closed the door, went downstairs. Was there anybody up there? Nobody. What do you mean nobody? There's nothing there, I said, you know. And I didn't sleep much that night. I can tell you. Roddery is a typical Welsh hill farmer. He spends many lonely hours tramping the hills and valleys of North Wales with his dog, working his flocks and struggling to keep his farm going. He lives in an isolated homestead tucked away in a fold of the hills within the shadows of Mount Snowdon. And it looks peaceful enough. But the house seems to act like a sort of psychic beacon, attracting paranormal activity into its orbit. I was sawing some wood and I could feel as if there's somebody behind me. So I looked up, looked round, I couldn't see nobody. So I looked up onto one of the rafters and there was an image of a man, an old man, hanging there. So I was spoken to the woman, the old lady who used to live in the farm next door, and she said that years ago, an old farmer had done away with himself, had hung himself from one of the beams there. I was babysitting for after he'd gone out to a party. And um, I, I wrote down some, I'm writing some poetry on the table. And then after, after the middle of that, I slept in the chair and then woke up. And uh, I could, uh, you know, felt a heavy presence in the room, you know. And uh, I got up and uh, went, walked around the room so I couldn't see anything. But, uh, you know, some fear came over me, like a fear of the unknown, you don't know what it is. And, uh, well, I think uh, the best thing I could do, I'd heard there were ghosts here, ghosts, spirits, and uh, from Rotary. But uh, I'd never seen them, and I never believed in spirits myself. So I decided to sing a hymn. One morning, uh, I got up and was really bad poltergeist, you know, what I found out later was poltergeist. The whole kitchen was smashed, you know. Cupboards were wrenched off the wall and, you know, and um, glass uh, pickling jars were smashed and the place was a heck of a mess, you know. And, you know, there had been some strength because the cupboards had been, the re old-fashioned ones had been really pinned into the wall, you know, with concrete and, and bits of steel like that, you see. And they'd been just ripped off the wall. I thought, God, I said something wrong here, you know. And I thought, God, oh, we've had a break-in. The vandals have been in and they've smashed the place up. But, you know, there was no break-in and the dog was in the house. But the strange thing was that night, I didn't hear a thing. If somebody had created that much of damage, <laughs> I wasn't drunk either, no. You know, and they that much of damage, you'd hear something, but I didn't hear anything, you know. And there have been many other similar events. Visitors to the house, for example, have talked of meeting strange figures. Some of the rooms have been left in a state of chaos with no apparent explanation. But over the years, the family got used to this state of affairs. They didn't like it particularly, but they came to accept it. 
until last year. Then Mariana's brother, who lived in London and had a successful career as a barrister, suddenly, for no apparent reason, committed suicide. Like Mariana, he'd grown up in the Welsh farmhouse and had strong emotional links with it. It seems that he began to appear to her on a regular basis, as if seeking help. Mariana was extremely distressed and felt she had to take some action. That was the time when I saw my brother at the end of the bed and um, it, uh, had, we, we'd lost him through suicide and he, he wanted help then. He was calling, you know, he's coming to me for help because he thought he couldn't leave this world. You know, he, couldn't, he wanted to meet up with his mum and the rest of the family, his other brother. So I was just getting so distressed. I said, I, you know, I just wanted to move out to the house because I was just seeing my brother's image at the end of the bed all the time. She came downstairs shaking and trembling and says, Audrey says, I just see my brother standing at the bottom of the bed. And it really frightened her. So I said, right, that's it, I said. I'm calling the professionals. As it happens, there is a quite extraordinary team of ghost hunters working in North Wales. The team is made up of three men all of whom are very highly regarded in their respective careers. Elwyn Roberts, on the right, is both a research scientist and an acclaimed poet at the annual Welsh festival known as the Eisteddfod. The Reverend Roberts in the centre, no relation, is a priest with a special assignment to deal with paranormal events. And Elwyn Edwards, on the left, is a counsellor and also an Eisteddfod poet. They have a very strong working relationship and they deal with the paranormal in a totally practical, down-to-earth manner. Uh, Elwyn is the man who is sort of able to manifest them, bring them out and all that thing. And then I tend to take over and say, well, now, what's your problem and how can we solve it? And I, she said to me, what, what's been your, what has been your work for the last 40 years? I say, well, I've been a clergyman, but I have been a uh, um, social worker for uh, the spirits of the, many of the departed. Putting people to rest, that's my main objective. And to let other people know that there are such things as ghosts and to prove to them what we are going, what we're doing and to prove to them that these people have lived by showing them the marriage certificates of so-and-so or the death certificates of so-and-so. I get it now and again off people, they tell you it's all in your head. Well, of course it is in the head, it works with the mind. But they don't realise that. And um, most people that I've seen, they, they're poo-pooing the story, no, they're not, no such thing. And it's a job to get them to understand, unless they can see them themselves, isn't it? And I'm sure if they did, you'd be frightened. It seems that some possibly discarnate minds, if that's what the explanation is, I'm not suggesting that I believe it. Um, they seem to be attached to places. Now, the, the standard explanation is that these are earthbound spirits or minds, which um, for some reason are, um, some emotional reason perhaps, are attached to a place or to a person um, that they don't want to let go. And for that reason, possibly don't progress spiritually. And uh, some of the work that we've done over the years uh, has been to try and help such minds, if that's the explanation, uh, when they uh, cause nuisance for people living in houses and so on. This trio of professional ghost hunters has, it seems, achieved a very high success rate across North Wales in confronting and resolving a whole series of strange, unexplained psychic events. They decided to set up a sitting, as they called it, to try to encounter whatever it was that was troubling Mariana. They held the sitting one evening in the farmhouse and claimed to have been totally successful. I started talking in Welsh with him. I knew he could speak Welsh, but he'd been away in London for so many years. He'd rather speak in English, so he turned to English. And I asked him, um, what happened? And he said, I can't tell you. Why can't you tell us? I'm too ashamed to tell you. Well, where are you now? I'm stuck, he said. Everywhere is pitch black and I can't move. I can't move on. And that's, and Elwyn described um, things which he saw about him, connected to him. 
And Miriana's father had left us about three weeks before, or a month before. So I asked Miriana, do you mind if we get your father here? Try and help him move on. She said no. And all of a sudden, they saw her father appeared. He was 80-odd. 80, 80 he appeared on Elwyn. So I asked him, um, what happened to, the, to your son? He said he's been a bad boy. And um, in the end, um, they both left. We've been there since, and they haven't appeared. Whatever the claims, the facts of the matter are that Mariana's problem went away. The apparent sightings of her brother stopped. But for the trio of ghost hunters, that wasn't the end of the matter. For them, the farmhouse had a special quality, a special vibration, as they put it. It seemed to be a sort of pathway for spirits seeking to make contact. They decided to come back to hold further seances here. In the lonely farmhouse in the valleys of Snowdonia, the three Welsh ghost hunters have now held several sittings with what they claim to be remarkable results. They claim to have encountered a wide range of spirits, not all of them from this area, what they call drop-in communicators. But some of them, they believe, actually are or were local people who they can trace in the historical records. Elwyn tells me, and, and Winnie, and, and, and all my, my, my sensitive friends tell me, when you go to a house when they say oh, we've got a ghost and you open up it's like Houston station in that house uh, there are umpteen of them and you've got to trawl uh, around until the right one uh, comes along it's very difficult you can go home and and you you met 10 13 14 of them but you haven't met the little fellow who's troubling the family the first man we had was Richard Richard Twin and um, he had lost six of his children, and I found him. He lived in a place called Tinawine, and he went to chapel at a place called Ridwernen. And Elwyn had the name of one son which had died, and he was called Riz. And I found him. He died in 1823. But uh, I haven't finished looking for him yet, but I know where to find him, I think. At one of these events, they claimed to have encountered an evil character called Harold. Eilwyn went into a kind of a hunch, and he said, God, he says, uh, something really terrible has happened in his kitchen. I can feel real, real hostility. And immediately, everybody in the room saw he changed. His clothing changed and his face changed. And I was standing up. And anyway, the, the, the the medium changed, and these, this guy had his face down with this, but he had these two eyes that were looking up. The most evil eyes I've ever seen in my life. They were full of bitter, and they were bitter and twisted. And there was a crease across his brow, and he looked really vicious, you know. And um, the medium says, I'd want him to take me over completely, you know. And uh, we got his name, Harold. Harold. And he spoke, uh, my name's Harold. And I had said, Shema Harold, hello Harold, and he said in Welsh, Carry your diaw, when go to hell. He said to me, I said, oh my God, I thought to myself, you know. And um, apparently we finally got out of him that he used to court a girl that was a maid in this farm in the middle of the last century. And uh, he came to, used to come to visit, and um, the girl finished with him. I didn't want anything more to do with them. And we'd never really found out what happened, but something really bad happened in that room. The ghost hunters decided to hold a sitting in the farmhouse that very evening. It was an extraordinary event, held in near darkness in Welsh, translated for us by Reverend Roberts. It went on for about two hours, and there seemed to be many strange, inconsequential encounters. But at one point, the medium, Elwyn, claims to have made contact with Harold again and this time with Mary, the maidservant, with whom he had a relationship all those years ago. What, Harold, what did Harold do in the next room? We know something dreadful happened in the other room. Tell us about it. Harold has been unkind. What has Harold done? 
everyone is crying, the medium is crying. Tell us, Mary, what has happened. Tell us what Harold did. We're on your side, Mary. He's a nasty man, we know. We met him before. Something horrible happened in the next room. What happened? He is hitting her with a poker. We knew all the time something dreadful had happened in that room. He's a nasty man. After that sort of experience, we have to ask what on earth is going on. The problem always, of course, is one of verification. The medium can say what he pleases. It could all be pure fabrication. Most scientists tell us that it is a load of old mumbo jumbo, but not all of them. Some scientists are seriously concerned to test the hypothesis that some psychic mediums may be tapping a quite different communications channel and coming up with valid information they couldn't have gained in any other way. Mediums are people who are supposed to be intermediaries between this world and the next. And there is no doubt whatsoever that there have been some genuine mediums in the sense that they have been able, over a, a period of time of decades, to obtain information that they simply could not have obtained in any normal way through the five senses. And of course, once you had ascertained that such people were genuine, then it became a question of whether they were actually acting as intermediaries between Uncle Harry on the other side, trying to convince the sitters that he had survived bodily death, or whether the mediums had the gift of abstracting all the relevant information from the minds of the sitters concerning Uncle Harry and then dramatizing that information as if it was Uncle Harry coming through from the other side. The point is, of course, that parapsychologists don't have to establish a hundred such cases, or even ten. One cast-iron case would be enough to indicate the possibility of a psychic channel of communication. A number of scientists have trawled the world for such a case. Professor Ian Stevenson, for example, tells an extraordinary story that comes from Iceland. He came through and uh, expressed great concern about not being fully buried, he said his his leg was missing, that when he'd been buried, they hadn't buried his leg. And to make a rather long story short, he later said that uh, his leg was in the wall of the house owned by one of the sitters, which seemed quite surprising, but it turned out that the uh, uh, communicator was uh, narrating details in the life of a, of a man, uh, an Icelandic man, who'd been something of an alcoholic, and he'd been at a, uh, a friend's house and on a stormy night he'd, he had taken too much uh, alcohol and was drunk. He was urged to stay the night but he didn't. He said, oh I can walk home and uh, like all drunks he staggered off and then um, probably had some more alcohol with him and drank. He fell asleep and it was stormy and the tide came in and uh, he was carried out to sea. And then later the body was washed up but it was without the leg. And uh, so that was duly buried, what they had of his body. But the leg was sort of left around, and finally it, it came to a place where there was some building going on, and the leg was actually, uh, the uh, person whose building it was didn't know quite what to do. They said, well, we'll just put it in this, in this wall. And there it was, and they opened up the wall and found the, uh, this leg. Now, there's no evidence, you see, there's the weak point. No evidence that that was the, the right leg, but the best part of that is that the deceased was a tall man and the leg was the, as a femur and uh, of a tall person, so that's a little, uh, little help there. Of course, the question of communication raises the fundamental issue, the absolutely $64,000 question at the heart of everything. Communication with what? 
let's suppose that um, some of the uh, mediumistic uh, communications are fraud, some are self-deception, but let's make the assumption, just for the sake of argument, that some of them are genuine. Well, all that tells us is the medium has got access to information from somewhere. Do we know where? Well, no, not really. If the sitters knew it, then maybe it's a type of telepathy. Um, you know, maybe there's some sort of collective unconscious that all of the information we know uh, is, is in the ether, as it were, and the medium can somehow pick up on it. Maybe there is actually a survival of bodily death, and the medium really is in touch with that person. Now, these are all theories. They've all been put forward to try and explain you know, the, the phenomena. I'm not convinced that, that any sort of mediumistic communication is genuine. But if it is, again, in terms of a theory, we're very much in the dark. If we say um, that spirit simply means the mind so we have a body a physical body which um, which is made of atoms and molecules and so on and it I tend to believe that this is manipulated by this other thing which we call mind now if mind is completely separate and independent though very closely connected with body during our earthly life then uh, bodily death will not mean the end of the mind. Elwin is not alone in that view. Several notable scientists would support him. And there is no doubt, there is a vast amount of evidence of psychic communication. Most of it is immensely fascinating, but much of it is also anecdotal and circumstantial. It doesn't create the cast iron watertight case that scientists are seeking. The jury is still out on the question of what it is that psychic mediums are tapping into to enable them to paint their view of the other world. But it is equally certain that nothing can shake the conviction in the minds of those who claim to have walked and talked in that other world. What it's done for me, it, it has absolutely stabilized my, 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 my faith. I, I, I believed before that there would be life after death, but you know, with all belief, there is a certain amount of that one, you know. But in this particular case, I know now, without a shadow of doubt, that there is life after death. And I also find that if I could show you or any other person one single ghost, I would have gone a long way to proving to you that there is life after death.